Sorry, I'm just recording the session. Um, uh, let me uh, let me introduce Doris. Doris is the head of creative uh, industry uh, from Invest Hong Kong. Um, I think anything related to creativity, including media, art, commercial design, um, is all under her wings. And we've uh, I can be a witness of that because we've been for around for a year, and we've been getting a lot of uh, insight, advice, and mentorship from Doris. And that's maybe the reason why we're still here. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic to Doris um, to introduce the panel speakers to everybody. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, thank you for your kind words. And thank you for inviting me, actually, to moderate this um, very interesting webinar and uh, with a very complex but very interesting topic, provenance for art documented with blockchain technologies. And we have here with us um, three very experienced speakers. Um, maybe I'll just introduce them one by one. Uh, Ian Liu is the partner of Intellectual Properties at um, Deakins. Prior to his legal career, um, Ling, uh, Ian worked in the high-tech financial software industry. And Ian advises on um, copyright and IP, as well as cutting edge technology law issues, including artificial intelligence, Web3, blockchain, smart contracts, virtual assets, NFTs, and the metaverse. And um, our second speaker, David um, uh, Tang, is the head of community growth at TZ APAC, where he is responsible for driving partnerships and facilitating greater education and talent development for the blockchain industry. David has partnered with multiple academic institutions throughout APAC to cultivate a strong regional community of digital artists and creators and driving further NFT adoption. Last but not the least, um, Ernest Yuan is a private collector. He examines the potential of provenance as the foundation to build a legacy for the future of Chinese Ant antiques and artifacts. He also played a critical role in publishing three books related to his family collection of 490 pieces of Ming and Qing antiquity. And Yuan is also a member of the advisory board of Asian Civilization Museum and Ming Chiu Society. So thank you very much uh, for all our speakers for joining us today. And first of all, maybe um, let's start by asking some questions on the legal aspects before we dive into the issue of provenance. So some questions for Ian first. What is the relationship between a smart contract and a legal contract and which area are often overlooked and what are some of the issues that needs to be considered? Uh, um, thank you, Doris, and thank you for your introduction. Um, this is a very good question. Um, we know NFT are based on smart contract, and there has been confusions that smart contract equals to legal contract. Although in some circumstances, smart contract um, can be used um, like a legal contract, but essentially, if you really look into it, if you ever code a smart contract, it is basically programs or code. When certain conditions are met, they will just execute automatically. So um, it is said to be similar to automatically enforcing contract, but it's not really a legal contract. So this would be the first confusion. And since this is, this is not a replacement of legal contract, then we will run into a danger that if we implement a smart contract mechanism, it actually doesn't match with the underlying or the overarching legal relationship between the parties. So that would that would cause issues um, down the road when we when someone tried to enforce certain rights um, executed by a smart contract, uh, payments have been paid maybe without legal basis, etc. So, one example just to illustrate this point um, is we we see that in NFT platform it's really common to have a feature called earner um, creator earnings or perpetual commission. And this is very welcome for creators because this is a way for them to get extra revenues uh, when the NFT is sold in the secondary market. But the issue will, will, will start to come in because the NFT is traded in the secondary market. And when people are trading in the secondary market, they are not trading off the platform. The terms of the platforms, the NFT platforms, would not be applicable to the new buyers. So usually what people will do 
they should have terms when they first sell the NFT in the platform, they will speculate that they, they was um, spe speculate. Uh, they will specify that in in the terms and condition. There should be a payment payable to the creator, so that a new buyer will and have agreed to to pay that payment. But when that condition and terms is missing, then the legal ob obligation is not there on the new buyer. So potentially that will cause issues down the road, disputes on payment, etc. But um, a bigger issue is we, we have a, a scheme that is unclear um, why someone is charging certain payments. And if there's a dispute or regulator looking at the overall scheme, how would they construe that payment? Would that be considered as management fees paying to a person for managing the NFT art? If so, then we may start getting into areas of securities and, and other areas of law. So on, on top of that, people often misunderstood uh, smart contract is basically a program. So if you um, commission someone to means an NFT, they may create they may write some program in smart contract form. Those are different from the NFTs themselves. They, they, they're different from the underlying art. And the smart contract should be treated um, differently in terms of copyrights, who owns that, uh, and are you getting a license to use it, et cetera. And, and other areas that people often misunderstood about NFTs are they, they would thought. Uh, NFT, the digital arts, is minted on the blockchain, but it's not really the case most of the time. And um, usually because the, the cost of minting a, a huge uh, digital data on the blockchain is really, really expensive, right? Even Ethereum has dropped so much. So what people would do is minting it off-chain using, using a web server or IPFS service. Um, to, to store that digital work. And people misunderstood that when you are trading an NFT, um, that may not be handling the, the underlying artwork as well. So these are issues. The, the last but not least is um, we, we, we are, when we are dealing with NFT, we cannot get away from handling or trading in cryptocurrencies. And because of the assets class um, of cryptocurrencies, there's issues like anti-money laundering and know, know your client, that's people often miss. So um, I'll stop there for now. <laughs> because um, I think the issues can go on and on. on and on. Um, and uh, let's go back to that uh, later on at the discussion, because um, this is some areas that I think our audience will also be interested in knowing more. Um, but say, for example, um, let's continue about the IP issue. So when you create an NFT of a physical item, just by scanning the object, um, are there any potential IP issues involved? Uh, if so, what are these issues? I, I, I would say it's potentially an IP minefield. <laughs> <If you're, Okay. laughs> and, and first, first of all, um, when you purchase an object, people sometimes misunderstood that if you get a physical object, uh, the IP rights on it also comes with it, but this is not the case. Let's say a piece of painting. If, if you buy a piece of painting, the physical piece of art, the IP right actually are separate. So, so what kind of rights you are getting is depends on the author of, of that painting. It's not, it, it's not automatically comes with the physical painting. Although while you get a painting, you will have an implied license to display it, to, to appreciate it, etc. This is the same as um, it's like when you buy a book or buy a DVD, you're not buying the, the entire IP rights of the book. You're not buying the, the uh, entire IP rights of movie. Right? That's why you cannot copy it. So it, uh, there's, once we understand it, um, and we need to appreciate that apart from copyrights on piece of object, um, like a sculpture or painting, um, when we are talking about certain 
articles that could be registered design rights and uh, registered design rights and unregistered design rights, and sometimes even trademark can be um, shown on those objects. So when you start copying, scanning that um, article object, essentially you're copying potentially you're copying the copyright, copying. Um, the registered design rights, uh, unregistered design rights, or depends on how you use it, you could be infringing some other people's um, trademark. So um, potentially it's really a minefield and um, you, you have to be very careful and do your due diligence, right? And, and one of the case of handle is people try to um, digitize or tokenize some old um, artifacts and um, of course, we were aware of potential of this copyright issue, but it also comes to issues um, because copyright protection period, if it's a natural person in Hong Kong, it depends on when that person died and the protection period is 50 years um, after, until 50 years of his death. So the first question, if you, you're trying to tokenize something rather old, but not old enough, uh, the issue is, are, are we able to identify the, the the owner, uh, the author, and is he or she still alive? Um, if if he's not alive or of deceased, and who owns the copyright existed within a fifty years period, and and that caused some of the difficulties uh, when we try to scan or digitize art. Mm. I think this is another topic actually for Screen Guru to think about. Um, that is the IP issues on, on NFTs um, for the next webinar, maybe. But um, okay, so um, in view of time, let's now talk about um, the um, issue of provenance. Uh, I would like to ask David from Tezos, um, how important is provenance of art documented by blockchain technologies, which is our topic for today as well? What do you think? Yeah. Um, thank you, Doris. Um, yeah, like I think that the art industry um, in general has always struggled with provenance. Um, it's not just like, you know, uh, even for like, like, like um, traditional works, right? It's not just identifying who the artists are. It's uh, especially for very old works, you, you really don't know some of the artists, whether who was the one that actually painted it. But also the question whether, you know, it's original piece or it's a counterfeit. Um, that's a very real um, issue. And if we look at it in the digital world of where everything is all in ones and zeros, um, this struggle is a lot more real because every single copy is digitally identical. Um, and in, in this case, without like no um, provenance and like traceability, it's very impossible. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to make like artworks, uh, artworks scarce and extremely challenging to actually provide meaningful value to virtual works. So I guess like we, especially with NFTs, the technology, right? That it allows artworks to be minted by a wallet address. Um, and you see it's similar to like a national ID number. Nobody, everybody knows um, which wallet address creates the artwork. Um, so if someone else were to copy it, it would just show that the NFT itself is coming from a different wallet address. So some artists, um, so there's some applications to it where it, uh, it, provides, um, it provides transparency, yet it can be anonymous. So some artists choose to do, sort of like, you know, dox their wallet address and can be public. But, you know, um, some artists are anonymous where they are like a bit like Banksy in real life, right? Um, uh, where, they, um, where they can just like, you know, hide behind a wallet address. And I guess like, you know, the, the whole idea that the number of additions in the artwork can be fixed. And because it's, it's a, uh, there's a number to it and it's recorded on the blockchain, which is immutable. Um, and every transaction is recorded as well. Um, this provides a very for, um, strong form of provenance um, in terms of like how we how we um, view digital works. Mm. Yeah. So what what do you think is the most challenging factor then uh, regarding provenance when it comes to NFT art? So yeah, like I think NFT um, in general is just a technology which provides artists like more control over their artworks, ownership of their artworks in the digital realm but still very difficult to control distribution because you can, while we can actually prove that, hey, you know, on a blockchain that who has a copy of the NFT, it doesn't mean you're able to stop people from right click and save if they want to. Um, you just can prove that, oh, you have a copy of it and, and you, you, you are the owner of a copy that's created by the original artist. 
that said, I've seen some artists that they have actually like figured very innovative sort of like um ideas to actually to actually counter this. So for instance, um there there's this artist which um um is a very popular artist on Tezos, his name is Zenken. He runs a print shop. So if you own a, um one of his artworks, it's, it's in a certain resolution, but it's not good enough to actually print it out. Uh, if you want to actually print it out. So he runs a print shop where he actually allows people that own the NFT itself to purchase plotted copies. So these are super high resolution of museum quality paper. Um, so I guess that's a way of how um, he um, he challenged um, like, like, like the, the idea of like, you know, people able to right click and save. And NFTs are, it's an all cure strategy um, when it comes to like, you know, um, digital distribution. There's still a lot of bad actors that you know um they copy or they mint existing artworks and they sell it. And um, like like what Ian mentioned earlier, right? You no, know, um some buyers as well. Um they they have the perception that you know if I buy this artwork, I own the commercial right to it, I, I own the distribution right to it. Um that's not true. Um, you don't own the commercial rights to print or distribute a movie just because you bought a DVD. Um, so I think a lot of this is more of like, you know, um, it's a new technology and there, there has to be an educational process for people to learn um, what's the best practice to safeguard themselves against bad actors or like, you know, what are their rights um, to this? Yeah, I think education is very important, and yeah. especially when the technology is so new and people are not very familiar with it. Um, so from the um, collector's point of view, so I would like to um, have some questions for Ernest. So as a private collector of antique and cultural artifacts, would you consider using NFT technologies to support the provenance of your collection then? All right, hi there, Doris. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, as a private collector um, in antiquity and cultural artifacts specifically, um, We've been coming upon a lot of these uh, technology to us, not just in this past two years, but it's been there since the last five, six years. Um, of course, in a very traditional antiquity world, of course, we want to preserve the artwork as much as possible in any, any format. But with NFT, um, I think the idea was good to start with, but I don't think it really fits the antiquity world to be in multiple level um, simply is because that it's it's antiquity is something where David also mentioned earlier is that it's 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 something that it's not easily replicable and and there is something that is a lot with because the day from day one provenance the word provenance is already engraved in, in the antiquity world. So everything has been traceable. And these works is, and you consider an, an antiquities starting at a hundred year plus. So a lot of these work in some ways already have some form of historic value and the use of materials, the use of the techniques. These are things that are, are, are a trademark basically for a specific time. And that goes back to where we were talking earlier about education. And, and there is, that's why university institution in developing specific educational program on understanding antiquity and classical artifacts. So that is something that NFT cannot be replaced by simply just digitalize it or to in some form of making it in that way. And that's why you have for example, with the, recently the, the Hong Kong Palace Museum, they have to have a team of professions to come in from all special areas. And they go through like almost like a medical doctor's degrees in order to be able to specialize in one specific field. And I think that's where um, it's something that NFT would not just uh, establish from this until this is gradually integrated into the educational program. And I think right now is, I think a, a lot of traditional institution and research center are still quite hesitant towards that. And, but for a private collector perspective is we also look into where everything has been traceable, where it's been, been done. And for example, in our collection, our family's been, been in collecting worlds for three generations. And, and all our 
our artwork is one through, um, we go through professional uh, educators to the world-class uh, specialists and then to do all these research. So to do even a publishing of one of our books, it took close to 15 years to make a publication and minimum at least five years just to get the right researcher specialist and the special appraisalist to get all that together and to put up something that's there. And until that is something is, has that value of historic research, I guess, in that perspective and the beauty and the aesthetic. Um, so I think in that spectrum, um, I think NFT will still take a, a some sort of time to really um, establish to that level. And I think to start with that, it still needs to work with properly the right institution first and, and with something that has been established. So I think people like first thing is where these things are coming out from. So if it's circulated from, for example, you have world-class auction houses and these are people would still go into comfortably to, to look into because it's not been established from a five years, 10 years time frame. It's been there for more than probably two or three decades, some of the older houses. So that is the reputation that's there and they, they're put up there for that. So I hope that you, that answers the question of, of from a collector's perspective. Mm. Um, but um, in terms of um, provenance compared to other conventional means, uh, what do you think is the advantage of NFT technologies then, as a means to document this um, provenance? Well, I think the advantages or the thing is that, um, okay, maybe as, as a secondary thing that, okay, that you could use it as a, a, a basically a probably as a reference point towards that. But I think at the meantime, what I think is challenging is where I think Ian also was pointing out earlier is that there isn't a, a substantial house that is a basically everyone has agreed or proved that it's like the central bank of NFT. And we need something like, like that right now. Um, and we're missing or a legal firm that is maybe the world top five or top 10. That's basically, there is a standard the authority. And I think right now there's still too much loophole and leakage towards that. So I think until that is established with institution, with professional industries that, that, that there is a standard, I think that could become eventually a secondary um, support. I think that that's it. But, but I think as you're looking at high arts, um, there is already a system that's been established through decades. And I think to easily to convert that um, from, from a traditional art, I don't think it will still take time, but it makes very much more sense more if you're trying to digitalize something. And that's the only reason I think that when you will look into NFT much more so. Mm. But I agree that um, standardization is quite important in this area as well, so that people can follow these standards set up by um, real professionals. Um, so back to some concerns around NFTs. Um, uh, David, there are a lot of um, volatility in the crypto space recently, and some call it crypto winter now. So how would this affect the economics of art creation, like um, the cost of minting an NFT? Yeah, um, full disclosure first, um, I, I'm extremely biased to Tezos. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, and I, I think that's why um, many artists gravitate towards um, the Tezos blockchain, right? It's because that it costs very little to mint an uh, NFT. Um, I think it's at the moment it's less than like 10 cents to mint an NFT. And the chain is like hyper gas efficient, um, being proof of stake, uh, um, which means it's a lot cleaner and greener. So I think that's one of the primary reasons why artists uh, also choose to use the Tesla blockchain. So uh, because you know, if it costs, um, if it uh, if it's very low cost, then you know I can experiment on it. I can use it as a medium to actually um, create artworks and actually see what I can um, generate from there. 
So maybe back to the um, maybe to the question that you mentioned, right? In terms of like volatility, I think like like the great deal of volatility, and of course, like you know, um, the 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 crypto winter portion it affects um, more towards speculation, but it doesn't really affect the underlying value of why people purchase art because like speculation people purchase this they want to sell it you know so if there's a winter they, they can't sell it um that's that's this is that's the main um, concern but for people that um are buying the specific um artworks that are minted as nfts um for their own collection they have no intention of selling it so so then in this case the crypto winter doesn't really um affect um the collectors but if you're looking at um towards the artist, right? I, I think it really depends on um, um what's the motivation factor for these artists. Um if it if it's if they're using it as a means of living, then of course no, um the underlying asset class that you are actually receiving as payment um is cryptocurrency and that's highly volatile. So it might make sense for you to um cash out quickly and actually pay your bills. Pay the uh, if you are under any, any countries that you require to, um you require to pay tax, or the NFTs um sale, then you, you should also cash out as well. So I think that's the underlying um idea, and of course like you know if you are okay holding um um a highly volatile asset, um which is which is a cryptocurrency, um then it's fine for you to hold. So I think that it really depends on how the artist wants to manage the risk, and how how important you know um receiving this um this 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 um cryptocurrency or holding these cryptocurrencies to them because i i know some artists that they uh, they've told me that hey i've never cashed out ever since i'm a i'm a i've actually um started uh, started meeting uh, my artworks um i have this amount of tests now which is a lot of money um and they have not and, and because like you no know, this 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 money is not uh, the primary source of income um they use the tests that they earn from minting artworks and actually selling the artworks to buy and support other artists. So, so it really depends on like, you know, what's the what's the intent and objective of the artist. Yeah. Mm. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Yes. Um, but what about as a collector, Ernest? Um, so in the midst of this um volatility um of the crypto space, um, uh, what concern do you have regarding NFTs? And would that affect your interest in NFT in the long run? Um, okay, as a, as a collector, I think you have to classify in different spectrum of collectors. Um, um, but I, myself, we're very much in the antiquity world. So I think in that perspective, um, I personally aren't a big fan of cryptocurrency myself, but um, because, uh, but because I, I just don't see there is a, a, a a core backing behind it, but that's just my, my own personal perspective. But as, as going back to volatility, I, I think in the world of volatility, in art, it's not, a, it's not an uncommon word. Uh, volatility has always been there. Um, but if you look at in a very traditional art and the modern art, there's a two spectrum. So there's living art and there's historic art. So if you look at in historic art, um, the volatility is relatively much less so because there is a historic value already been there. So anything you're looking at is going back where it's 100 years. It, it's relatively, uh, you grow, the growth of that is relatively stable because it's, it's, it's already a, a artifact and, and there's a history to it. So you're buying very much of a history. But if you're looking at something that's much more in a, a living artist or a, a contemporary artist, um, the volatility is much more because um, the spectrum of that is there's a lot of hypes, there's a lot of promotion, it, 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 because you know, I think more of the new modern artists are using this as a way to market themselves, to approach younger art, audience. And for that, I think definitely there's a much higher volatility. Um, but going back, to, does this really affect me looking at NFT? No, I don't think so. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm being very optimistic as a, as a, as a, as a collector uh, to see what NFT would lead to. Eventually, if there is something that is more established, but I think in the meantime, there is still a lot of work towards that until there are, um, I guess, hosting or operators 
that is so established with a structural format to the collector world. I think there is a potential and, and I think that's how I see it. Thank mm. you. Well, um, I think optimism is always there. And therefore, um, despite all this volatility, people are still very keen on knowing more. Um, and back to some uh, legal issues, Ian, because uh, we were talking about a fractionalized NFT these days. And in fact, many international museums are also trying to engage more audience by fractionalizing some of the more classical masterpieces into some very affordable NFTs. Um, and we are seeing sort of like more and more museums or institutions are trying to do something like that as well. What issues um, should the museums or the collectors be aware of? Right, um, yeah, it's interesting you bring up this question. Um, and it kind of makes sense uh, when, we, when we can tokenize something and then it, technically it would be very easy to split that into shares. Um, that's what they call fractionalization. Um, and it is, and has proved to be successful in some countries like Japan uh, and people doing fractionalized art. Um, um, but Hong Kong, um, this bit area that needs to be developed in terms of the legal framework. Uh, I touched on securities a bit earlier and it happens um, a couple of weeks, um, maybe a month ago in another Invest Hong Kong talk, um, Elizabeth Wong, um, the directors of SFC um, made a statement um, about the position of professionalizing um, um, NFTs. And um, the SFC thinks that they may be crossing the boundary um, of just normal art is going into the investment area and it may become regulated. So the, the, the key question is, um, it only falls within the SFC jurisdiction if it is securities. Securities under the Hong Kong law means it's shares or debentures or collective inv investment scheme, CIS. And when we start fractionalizing it, um, and if plus with some other elements like um, is it managed, et cetera, then it start to look like, like a bit of fund or manage, right? manage fund, it fall within the scope of CIS. And that's, that's why the uh, SFC start to be concerned about it. But it is it's a very difficult question. We, we are in a decentralized world with web free technologies. And things work slightly differently. Right? We, we may have fractionalized in it, but without really a physical, Right, a human manager that we can identify. Um, would, would that be different? Right? And I think this is an area of, of law that needs to be developed. And we yet to see cases and see how that, um, that go to play out. But the thing is the current climate um, globally um, about SFT, F, F, NFTs and cryptocurrencies that they the, the regulators start to scrutinize it, right? In that there are, there are incidents that people trading cryptocurrencies and um, or using insider information to sell NFT. They in the U.S. they were charged for insider trading, and and to be honest, this is this is a crime that I would not thought that ever be possible because like normally insider trading is talking about. Um, confidential information of a company that were affecting share price. And if we are dealing with bought apes or crypto punk, um, and why would that be related to share price? So um, this is it's going to develop. And we know in Hong Kong, um, end of last, last month, the amendment of the anti-money laundering um, um, uh, and anti-money laundering bill amendment um, came out and um, virtual assets is going to be regulated. And uh, with that, um, the regulator may also be empowered to determine what is virtual assets. So we, we yet to see um, what could be virtual assets. Uh, would NFT be? Um, but 
from a legal perspective, we really want to secure laws so that we, we know where the boundaries. Mm. And from a bias point of view as well, we want to know whether this is legal or not as well. But um, say for for a collector, uh, when, when they buy an NFT, what kind of rights does it incur then? Can the collector use it, say, for example, on social media? Well, this is, yeah, this is a very interesting question, right? Um, so I mentioned about uh, who owns the copyright, right? What, how can you use it? It comes down to what kind of rights you are granted um, by the owner or the author. So it really depends. Um, for NFT, like um, Bored Apes, um, they have some limited commercial use right granted like you can you can have some uh, merchandising uh, t-shirt printed with the bob apes um, that's allowable uh, but for some of the nfts they may just allow private non-commercial use and uh, when you're talking about social media it really comes down to what are you going to do with the social media so is that personal social media or are you trying to market it uh, commercial use um, the, the answer will be different. So, um, so the answer is it really depends on what you what you are granted. And for um, owners of of um, art, they need to be aware what kind of rights they they have, and uh, and they need to license it or sell it or exploit it um, carefully. Right, you are not giving out too much, <laughs> um, and. Uh, and protect your rights and make sure you, you secure your revenue. Mm. And um, since we're now um, in a um, later part of our discussion, I will encourage our um, participants to send in their questions if they have anything they want to ask Ian, David or Ernest. And um, I'm just checking, we, are, uh, we have a questions for you, Ian, from our participants. Um, uh, his, uh, he or she is asking for traditional artists in contemporary fine art, how can they protect their copyrights in an artwork, a, crea a creation when people, practically anyone, can take a picture and then start minting it and sell it in the marketplace? I think, um, I think that the difficulty of protecting is more practical than, than legal. So, um, as I said, the owner, the author, the owner, the author would own the um, copyright of it. So um, that picture, when someone taking a picture of it, um, probably infringing the rights, especially trying to uh, means it and then sell it in the marketplace. Um, uh, there, there are certain exceptions, really. Like, is it incidental to? To a photo or something. If you're taking a photo or you're taking a movie, then it just it just happened that a piece of art in the background is an incidental inclusion. So, um, it it knows those kind of issue, but I I would say we try to take a picture and basically it's a copy and then start minting and selling it. Definitely is infringing. Um, the issue is how can we catch those? Uh, the marketplace um, they usually don't really look at infringing work. They, they have terms and conditions. They ask for the people putting the artwork on the market to warrant that they are not third party infringing works. They are original, um, they own them, etc. cetera. Uh, but the, the marketplace, at least, uh, at least under Hong Kong law, they don't really actively look because um, that would induce constructive knowledge that they know something infringing, then they have to do something about it. And for the artists, uh, it's difficult, it's going to be. So the difficulty is um, not apart from the marketplaces, that also um, the work can be posted anywhere on the internet. How can you find that? And um, I know some kind of technology can, can do, it needs to be good AI technology to, to identify similar things. That's, similar digital files. And if you make use of those technologies, then you, um, some companies you can pay a fee they can scan an internet for you and you can find, find out those infring infringers. Um, but the next question is, um, you, are you able to 
actually locate a person behind? Are you able to locate them and then force them to pay? Um, I, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Mm. Yes, challenging, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, back to David. Um, so for from the creator's point of view, um, let's say they want to create an NFT art, but it is um, not like creating any um, conventional art. So what are some of the relevant issues and what have people in the industry done to help artists, particularly those that are not very tax savvy to overcome these kinds of issues? Yeah, um, thank you, Doris. Um, I think like, there's the misconception, right? Um, because there, there are many conven um, many conventional arts that's actually created as NFTs. Um, John Kalija, a Filipino painter, he's created a lot of pieces using oil paint, combined them into a stop motion animation, and like you know, um, and that that worked really well. Um, but also echoing um Ernest, um, that you know, um, like especially with antique uh, and uh, with antiques, um. It doesn't make sense to digitalize this um, because I know the provenance, the, the, the main appeal of these antiques actually dates back to the 100 years of history. So if it makes sense to keep it as a physical piece, it should be a physical piece um, because the 3D object will obviously lose a lot of the essence um, when it comes to that piece. And also um, what Ian says about, I know, fractionalizing classic masterpiece, like, you know, you have a host of legal issues. Um, so. So yeah, it's just the idea that you know, hey, hey, um, people agreeing that you know it's governed by smart contract doesn't mean that it's a legally binding contract. Um, that's it. Like at this juncture in time, um, we definitely see a lot more new media art, uh, more generative, interactive animation, illustrations, typography kind of artworks, and I think. The reason why we're seeing this is because um, specifically these categories of artworks, they, um, they don't have a form of provenance for the longest time. So it was very difficult for people to, and buyers to actually purchase such um, artworks. So yeah, and I think like in terms of issues, there's also a lot of hurdles for um, artists um, to actually mint their first NFT because um, to mint the NFT, they have to have some cryptocurrency um, um, to, mint, uh, to create their first work. Um, this means they have to actually, you know, look for an on-ramp uh, on -ramp exchange, do the required KYC, depositing money, purchasing some cryptocurrency, withdrawing the cryptocurrency to, to, to on-chain wallet. You, you can see that the process is, there's so much things they have to do before they can even mean their first NFTs. I think they are the creator, where, right? They, yeah. they need to create, and they are the creative <laughs> person. They are not these kinds of technical persons yeah, to yeah. deal with all these that complex process. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's where there's a lot of like artists communities, right? That actually help them out with this. Um, to actually help them, hey, you know, why not instead of you onboarding so much things, I just give you um I just I just pass you like you know some enough cryptocurrency to mint your first um artwork. And this could be like you no know, 25 cents or even 50 cents. Um and I think the other other factor, especially for um a lot of um uh, contemporary artists that they're still living artists um but but they're famous um the ones um is that you know um, the fact that they have to start from zero in the nft space um in the conventional art world these famous artists they will be supported by galleries who will be you know describing their artworks helping them with the marketing to potential buyers publicizing you know the the, the shows that they put up but in the nft space these artists have to you know create their own social media presence connect to their uh, community, go on Twitter spaces, Discord, um, Discord channels, and talk. So it's a, it's a very different ball game for like like um for artists to actually go into the NFT space because now 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 they have to do, do everything on their own. So I guess there's um that's where yeah I think it's very important to look at communities, um, especially for um if you're looking at like NFTs and the the importance of like you no know, having a circle of uh, of people supporting you in your journey. Mm -hmm. Um, that's very interesting. And we've got many interesting questions coming from the audience. Um, there's another one. Um, I think this one, maybe Ernest, you can um, handle this one. Um, the audience is asking, will the constraints or issues discussed so far um, maybe stifle the growth of um, physical art NFT? And um, 
like how do you associate the value and authenticity authenticity of a hundred year artifact to an nft okay so yeah okay well there's there's, there's the nft well to use to authenticity on a, a traditional artifact let's say um first of all is that a lot of these and artifacts are there's also this classification in artifacts as well. So let me let me uh, make it a little bit more clear. There are there are artifacts that was been circulated, and they are been looted. They've been traded, and all these very much are has been documented. So now there's a there, there is an issue, but especially in more let's say in the Renaissance or traditional Western art, they are quite well documented. Um, there is institutions throughout Europe and and universities, so as so as and these big institutions, South of these uh, education, Christie Auction House Education, they have specialists that they go through all the pieces with maybe a team of several set specialists to look at these pieces, and they are, and they are, once they are done. Um, they they give a, they go through also they go through technology reading as well which they have now infrared age X ray machines they withdraw some of the material substance that's from the the original artifact to track which period of time this piece is relevant towards this actual artwork um, but the main thing is that's why a lot of uh, and to art, traditional artifacts is that it's to be circulated, it's always somewhat documented. It is required to do that. And, and also where the provenance part comes in is that because you, you are traceable, let's say in, in Asian antiquities, of course there was the revolution things in different places world, things are scattered from different things. But eventually it goes back to houses certain collecting house and and which is very much is the galleries or the families and these families are very much traceable where they acquire these pieces originated from is it from the court is it leaked out from the court is it gone from a merchant and these merchants are also should be quite reputable merchants and that's very that's where antiquities in some ways came from but of course where the challenge part is where there's a lot of artifacts that maybe let's say is found recently or been digged out or been that. That requires also time and you need to send off these, these pieces to the special institution for authenticity and research. And that could take time to be for that. And NF, for NFT wise, I guess that um, where I think David was mentioning earlier, which is, this is something that is um, a, a newer technology that basically um, it just maybe for for if I'm going to put it into the traditional, it's just maybe an alternative layer. But but I think at the same at the moment, there's no one authoritable body that's really using that as an alternative blockchain tech um, support. And I think that's that's often people confuse that with. NFT gives a, a additional security of where the, the goods has been uh, more traceable or has been more protected. No, I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't think it, it, it is at this point. I think a lot of people are still quite confused with that. Um, but it takes time. But but with traditional artifacts, um, actually the whole structure has been there since hundreds of years ago. Even in the imperial times of China, the emperor documents some of these goods where he, that's why they check it, the emperor loved. So there is, there is a document, there's always a record. So I hope that kind of gives a sense of where the question. And um, so we are still getting questions. So another follow-up questions for Ian. Um, the audience asked, uh, because you have raised a really fascinating questions on the author of smart contract. 
and um, the regulatory perspectives. So does Ian perceive other problems with the contract journey, perhaps in the acceptance? I think um, if we are trying to map um, smart contract to legal contract, legal contract um, has three elements in, in Hong Kong law, common law. Um, offer acceptance, um, the server consideration, and whether the party intend to be legally binded. So um, if we have to really analyze smart contract in that way, we have to look at all these three elements one by one. And when we start um, trying to map those um, the, as what we pose here, the questions, we, we, we have to start asking where is the offer or when and where and when is the acceptance it has to happen. Are they, are they done by the, by the right parties? Someone, someone say the developer um, deploying a smart contract as an offer, mm, that could be right or could be wrong. Um, the people, the person using a smart contract as acceptance, that could be right or could be wrong. It it's really depends on, uh, we have to look at the legal relationship. Um, who are the actual parties? So, um, if it's a transaction, we usually is doing with a buyer or a seller using using a smart contract. It need not be the developer or um, or the person deploying uh, the smart contract. So, if we uh, people people get confused to try to map these element and get into, uh, I would say it's kind of like getting into the rabbit hole. Um, and these these arguments are not really meaningful um, to me. We, if we start looking at smart contract, it's just a mechanism, as I said earlier on. And this this is just a mechanism executing um, certain things. And on top of that, there, there's a legal relationship. Um, and the offer acceptance of, often takes place over there rather than during the operation of the smart contract. So when we start break down these two layer and we have that these two layer really clear in our mind, then I, these these confusions wouldn't come in. Um, yeah, and then the world would be a lot more straightforward if you know it that way. I mean, I've been like looking at the NFTs world as my country. <laughs> at least this this part of the world will be a lot more straightforward. If we separate smart contract and then and don't don't think them they are doing exactly the same as legal contract. Although there are some instances that if the, the smart contract mechanism and the legal relationship just coincide. But I would say this is the exception rather than alarm. Mm -hmm. So um, I also have an other follow-up questions. Um, the audience asks, uh, since NFTs today are mainly traded on um, OpenSea platform or other kind of platforms using cryptocurrencies, and actually this will restrain art collectors that are not familiar with crypto um, or even um, they are not tax savvy to be involved. Um, so I guess um, the question is, what's next? Um, can we do away crypto, but still uh, deal with NFTs in a non-crypto currency way? I don't know. Like um, to, um, I mean, I mean, there's an answer to it in China. Um, they, they do, NFT with a different name, they call it digital collectibles. Yes. And it's definitely without cryptos. So um, their technically- own, Their own digital currency. Yeah, uh, technically <laughs> it's possible, yes. <laughs> but, um, is, is, it, um, is it good or bad? I don't know how to comment. Um, but it's, it's certainly, um, there, are, there are a lot of uh, fraud and maybe not very proper behavior surrounding cryptos, but um, these are part of the innovation, I would say. I mean, without, without Bitcoin and all these um, consensus mechanism and um, without this very novel way of decentralization, we, we are not here talking about NFTs and um, without all these wild dreams, we are not innovating. 
So if we start killing off creativity, it may it may be good for adapting something already exists, but it may not be good for uh, I would say innovation. But mm. it's just my personal view. Well, sometimes um, platforms are using fiat as well. Um, maybe back to um, David, um, what do you think um, this kind of, is, is this will be the future direction um, or how, how, do you, how do you look at it at the development and the trends? Yeah, maybe um, switch maybe, back to fiat. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe tackling in terms of like uh, there's another, I think there's another question in terms of interoperability right of, of, of the marketplaces so like usually the nfts are minted on a on a specific blockchain uh in terms of like um interoperable blockchains and nfts that means nfts that can move over blockchain i'm not going to tackle that that's a whole big story over there um but yeah like, like i think there's different marketplaces which um cater to different audience um, so um, there are there are marketplaces where they accept um, fiat currency. Um, so if you um, so me example the clear example that everybody knows is like the bot apes. Um, most celebrities when they buy the bot apes, um, they don't actually own crypto. They um, they purchase it through MoonPay, which gives them an invoice. That's how traditional it can get. Um, there's uh, other platforms on Tezos that also facilitates uh, um, like credit card transactions, uh, but these all have to be sort of centralized because there has to be a party which accept fiat currency. Um, so, so I think it's it's more towards um, it's more towards which platforms um, it's um, um, like you know the hours can be purchased, and there are also uh, platforms like uh, Versam on on Tezos, which is um, any artworks that are minted on Versam. Um, are not able to be traded elsewhere because they have a very strict control in terms of like, you know, um, the KYC ver uh, verification and, and controls because um, then make sure that the, 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 the hit all the legal and, um, and compliance law. So I think that's the case. And um, of course, like, I think the, the other point um, in terms of like, um, yeah, NFTs, there's not on Ethereum. Like um, NF NFTs is very broad. Um, it can be on multi um like there's different communities, um for NFTs. So like um Tezos does have one of the largest um number of art collectors as well as um art creators. So um, it depends on what kind of NFTs. If you're looking at gaming NFTs, um the collectibles, which is the the doodles, body apes, um, crypto punks, and all those. Or are you looking at like, you know or gaming NFTs? So um so. Yeah, I, I think that liquidity um, really matters if you are looking at it for more towards like speculation um, and so on. But like, you know, um, NFT is more of a technology um, that, yeah, there, there, are, there are multiple different um, blockchains which support different communities. There are different platforms um, for different communities to use as well. China, um, I know some NF digital collectibles, they actually go to traditional auction houses. <laughs> so it's NFTs, but it's like, go, um, Fiat based. Um. So so yeah. Like I think that's um that's the that's my view in terms of like hey there's there's many solutions um for for to solve that question. Yeah. Yeah. And um thank you very much um for all our speakers in in sharing the the views and all our participants. Um there are many questions here that uh, we don't have time to answer because I'm very conscious of time and we have overrun a little bit as well. So um maybe I'll just pass back to um screen gurus Peter uh, to wrap this up. Thank you, Doris. Thank you, all the speakers. I think this is an interesting evening. We sort of highlight a lot of loopholes, potentials, and challenges in terms of provenance on NFT. Um, I think it's history in the making, and we are all contributing to that history together. Um, this is the first panel that we have programmed as part of our Trust the Bloom uh, All Women AI Art Show that we're putting on. Uh, there will be other panel uh, discussion regarding underrepresentation of women and also the potential and challenge of um, generative art as a way for artists to proliferate. Uh, watch out for our show show. Uh, we are on screenscrew.io. Uh, thank you everybody tonight. And uh, once again, thank you Doris for moderating the panel. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.